Hello, in this video we're going to explore the key concepts behind reactance and impedance. We're going to look at potential dividers made from reactive components and discuss where we'd use such circuits in the real world. If you keep watching to the end you'll see how we can create a simple filter circuit using SPICE. So with that, let's make a start. So we should all be familiar now with resistance in a DC circuit. So a resistor has a resistance, it's measured in ohms, and it's basically a, a resists current flow. That The bigger the resistance, the harder it is for current to flow around that loop. Okay. So reactance is no, difference re no different really, it's just you could almost consider it as resistance in an AC circuit. But capacitors and inductors have reactance. Okay, and we saw in our lecture video how we can calculate that reactance. So we saw that for a resistor, then the reactance, we give it this symbol X, is just equal to the resistance, so of course it's still got the unit ohms. We saw for an inductor, we've got the symbol X, but its reactance is equal to omega, the angular frequency, so that's say radians per second value, times the inductance. So if we're offer operating at 100 radians per second and we've got a 100 millihenry inductor, the reactance will be, you know, 100 milli times 100. Okay. And we saw for capacitors that the reactance is equal to 1 over omega c. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go over to the board and we're going to have a look at a really simple circuit and we're going to talk about what we can use reactance for and what, what's its limitations. So let's just draw that circuit out. So we had a source here, an AC source. So we know it's AC because it's got that little symbol like that. And it had a waveform, voltage as a function of time, is equal to our amplitude, 50, cos, I'm not left enough room here, have I? cos, and it was 2,000 radians per second times time, okay? That was our waveform provided by our source. And then we had an inductor here. Okay, and we told in this question that L is equal to 100 millihenries. So the, let's try something now. Let's try and calculate the current flowing around this circuit. So the current flowing around this circuit, Ohm's law tells us what that is, but instead of using R resistance, what we're going to use is X reactance. Okay, so we need to write down what the reactance of this inductor is, and we know it as omega L. So we know omega from here. So we can simply type 2000 times 100 milli. Let me get my calculator. So 2000 times 0.1 basically is 200, right? And its value is in ohms. So what we can do now is we can look at our waveform and we know the amplitude's 50. So when we're applying 50 volts across this inductor, we can just use ohms line, we can say 50 volts divided by 200 ohms will give us our peak currents. Okay, so 50 divided by 200 gives us a current of 250 milliamps. So there we've used reactants to find the peak current in that circuit. Okay, and that's useful, right? If you buy an inductor, you need to know what current it can handle. Okay, so, you know, if you look at a, a component supplier, every inductor you see will have a, an inductance and it'll also have a current handling capability. It might be 100 milliamps, it might be 10 amps, okay? So you now know that you can use reactants to calculate that peak current. So that's what we can use reactants for, but what's its limitation? Well, what we don't see here is anything to do with phase, okay? And really, this... 250 milliamps does not occur at the same time as our 50 volts. It's a more complicated situation. There's a phase difference here. And by looking at the reactants, we're completely missing anything to do with phase difference. Okay. 
So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open this same circuit up in LT Spice and we're going to explore exactly what's happening in this circuit. So here's my LT Spice window. I'm going to draw a super simple circuit. I've got a voltage source. Can someone please mute their mic? I'm going to put my inductor here. I'm going to wire it up. Of course, we're working in spice. We need a ground. This was 100 milli henrys. And our waveform, it's a sinusoid, no DC offset, amplitude 50. Here we have to be a little bit careful. We said 2000 radians per second, LT spice wants the value in hertz. So we need to divide that by 2 pi. So we do 2000 divided by 2 divided by pi gives us 318 hertz roughly. Okay, so there's our AC source set up. And let's run this simulation now. I'm going to show you two things. First, I'm going to run it for a 0.1 of a second. And we put our probe there to measure the voltage. We can see the voltage. It's how we expect it to look. It's going up to 50 volts, down to minus 50 volts. The frequency is right. Let's now click on that inductor. And we can see something here that should ring alarm bells to you guys. If you look at the voltage waveform, we're going to plus or minus 50 volts. And if we look at the current waveform, we're going between 0 and 500 milliamps. That's looking odd. Okay. And that's actually because LT Spice is, is doing something a bit more advanced than our analysis. It's considering the initial transient. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just skip a little bit. I'm going to say time to start saving data. I'm going to wait for two seconds and I'm going to stop saving data at 2.1 seconds. Now, when I rerun the simulation, we can see that our current's going between plus or minus 250 milliamps, which is what we calculated on the whiteboard. But we can see something really important. Look, let's zoom in. There is a phase shift between current and voltage. Okay. Our 250 milliamps does not occur at the same time as our 50 volts. Okay. That's a really crucial concept. And that's why using reactance is perhaps not as important as using impedance or as useful as using impedance, which we're going to talk about on the next slide. But just for the sake of argument, let's just quickly delete that inductor and pop in a resistor. So if I set this resistance to 10 ohms, we're putting 50 volts peak, we're going to expect 5 amps, right? Okay. So now, annoyingly, because SPICE auto scales things, we're seeing the two waveforms sat perfectly on top of each other. So we're going up to 5 amps in current, and we're going up to 50 volts in voltage, and the phase difference between the two waveforms is zero. Okay, look, the... This is the fact that there is, you can actually see a difference here is simply because, you know, there's some simulation error. Um, and let's replace that resistor now with a capacitor. And having watched the video, you should really remember what the phase difference is going to look like. Let's set this at an arbitrary 100 microfarads. So that's our voltage, put our current probe on. Now we can see that the current actually leads the voltage by 90 degrees. So the current peak comes before the, the voltage peak and they're offset by a phase shift of 90 degrees. Okay, so let's go back to our slide. So that's what we use reactants for, and that's what its limitations are. It doesn't give us any phase information. So the second key point in our lecture is about impedance. So we saw three equations for impedance, and in the video lecture, we saw how we actually calculate those. You know, it's, they're basically the same values, the same numbers as reactants or letters as reactants, but they now include either a J so a complex number for in inductors. And when we convert that to a phaser, we get omega L at a phase shift of 90 degrees. And for a capacitor, we saw the impedance is given by minus J times one over omega C. 
And if we convert that value into a phaser, we get one over omega C at an angle of 90 degrees, minus 90 degrees, sorry. Okay. So you must be familiar using impedance for this module, for the remainder of this module, I should say. It's absolutely vital in AC circuits that you understand basically these three equations, where they came from and how to use them. Okay. So let's go to the whiteboard now and let's solve this circuit again, thinking about the current, but let's use the impedance instead. instead. So I'm going back to the whiteboard. Let's remove all this on reactants. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the impedance of my inductor. So ZL which is equal to J omega L. So I'm going to get my calculator and I'm basically going to do 2000 times 0 0.1 because that's 100 millihenries. Uh, I, I don't know why I'm really reaching for my calculator. I shouldn't really be able to need to use a calculator to calculate that one. So here I'm getting J 200 ohms. So that's the impedance of that inductor. And note, it's frequency dependent. So it's only that impedance at this frequency. Obviously, if we change the frequency to 4,000 radians per second, that would be J400 ohms, right? Okay. So now we've got the um, impedance in its complex form. And you should know how to convert that now into a phasor, for example. So we can simply write this in phasor form as 200 at an angle of 90 degrees. So to find the current, what we can do is we can do a, a phasor division. So we can write our voltage waveform as a phasor. So in phasor form, we convert that voltage waveform into 50 with no other angle. Okay, there's no plus any angle here, so we can just put zero, de zero degrees there. And now we can use Ohm's law. So current equals voltage divided by impedance. And we just need to do a phasor division. Um, I'm running out of a little bit of space here, but I'm going to write it somewhere here. So to calculate the current, we need to divide the voltage, and we'll do this in the phasor form, 50, 0 degrees, divided by the impedance, 290 degrees. And you should all be familiar now with how to divide phases. We spoke about it last week. So here we're going to do 50 divided by 200, which basically gives a quarter. And when we're dividing phases, we need to subtract their angles. So we're going to do 0 minus 90. So we get minus 90 degrees. Okay. So therefore, we've got our current in the phasor form. I'm going to make a little bit of space. The last thing to do, really, to finish this problem off, although, you know, I didn't actually write, you know, to do this, is to write this current waveform in the time domain sort of form. So we start, say, I is a function of T. Of course, it should be a, a lowercase i rather than a capital I um, because it's time varying. Um, our amplitude is basically a quarter, 250 milliamps, as we saw in the simulation. We're using a cos because we've got a cos here. The frequency doesn't change, 2000 T. And now the phase shift of our waveform is minus 90 degrees. So here we've used the the um, impedance to calculate the current, and it's much more powerful. It hasn't just given us the peak, you know, the amplitude. It's actually given us the phase information as well. So now when we go back to SPICE, and we put our inductor back in, we run this simulation again, and we look at our current, we can see we have that minus 90 degrees phase shift between current and voltage, just as we predicted. And you can see the amplitude, as, as, we, as we already saw, is 250 milliamps. So what we wrote on the whiteboard is correct. We've successfully used impedance to calculate that current waveform. 
And to, to be successful in this course, you, you have to be very familiar with doing that. We're going to be doing this in every single lecture going forward. Okay. So that brings me on to my third point. And this, I'd say this is probably the most important point of the week, but actually this is the most important point of the entire course. Okay. So the circuit you see on this slide is the foundation of practically every other lecture we're going to be doing this entire semester. It's the foundation of everything we'll do when we're talking about power in AC circuits. It's the foundation of everything we'll do when we're talking about um, filters. There's free lectures on filters, all using a circuit that looks like this. And it's almost a resonant circuit, it's just missing one component. Okay, so you should recognize this circuit on the slide as a potential divider or a voltage divider circuit. So when I say those words, if, if you don't instantly know what they mean, you need to go back to your notes and look at potential dividers, okay? It's essential you understand this. And really, we can actually model many, many electrical items using, you know, just two, two components, a resistor and either an inductor or a capacitor. So for an example here, I've pictured a, uh, an electric motor um, this probably could be modeled as a resistance plus an inductor, just as you see this circuit here. And this light bulb here, it's actually got a plasma inside it. So this could be modeled as a resistor plus a capacitor. And there's sort of countless other things you can model in the real world, just using a, basically a complex impedance. So it's essential you know how to deal with this uh, particular circuit. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to go over to the whiteboard and I'm first going to do a DC example, so everybody's on the same page, and then I'm going to solve this circuit. And then, of course, you're going to get to have a go as well. Okay, so let's flick over. Okay, so I'll draw it as an AC source. I'm going to just draw two resistors for now. And I'm going to say my output voltage, V out, is across that lower resistor. And I'll give this resistance a 2 ohms. 2 ohms. And I'm going to say this is 4 cos. And then I'm going to set my frequency to 0. So basically, it's a 4 volt DC source. It's as simple as that. In fact, let's not overcomplicate matters. Let's just write it as a 4 volt source. If I want to calculate the current in that loop, every single person listening to this should be able to give me the answer off the top of their head immediately. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say Ohm's law tells me voltage divided by resistance gives me current. So I've got four volts. I've got two plus two ohms. So that's four ohms. So therefore I have one amp flowing around that circuit. If that confuses anybody, go back to your notes on lecture one. If I want to calculate the voltage across this lower resistor, I need to use Ohm's law again. I know it's got now one amp flowing through it. So one amp times two ohms gives me two volts. It's a potential divider. It's divided the voltage, the potential that we've applied across these two resistors. If I make this three volts, uh, three ohm, sorry, and this one ohm, then we still got one amp flowing and we'd have one amp times three ohms, which would give us three volts across this lower resistor. Okay. At AC, nothing changes. Exactly the same process we go through. Apart from we're not using resistance, we're using impedance and it might be a complex number. So don't think it's much more complicated than anything you've already done. It's not. It's exactly the same as what you've already done. So I'm going to draw the lecture, the, the, the circuit from the slide. You probably can't see it, but I, I still can. So we had an AC source. It has an amplitude of 50. And it was 2000 T. We went into a resistor here and that had a resistance of 200 ohms. And then we have an inductor. That's 100 millihenries. Sure. 
So I'm gonna start by finding the current in this loop, but before I can do that, of course I need to do the conversion from in inductance into impedance. So we've just seen J omega L, 2000 times 0.1 gives us J 200 ohms. Let's write that in the phasor form, 290 degrees. And let's write our voltage waveform also as a phasor. So that should be labeled V of T, V is a function of time equals, and then we can use our capital V to tell us we're talking about phasors, 50 knob phase shift. And in previous years, students have asked, well, what would happen if, you know, this was 2000 T plus say 45 degrees, you would simply put 45 degrees in place of this zero here, okay? So now we've got enough information to start solving this circuit. So let's calculate the current. And to do that, we need to do V over Z. So I equals V over Z, which equals 50 divided by 200 at an angle of 90 degrees. And we've already worked out that that's basically 250 milliamps or a quarter at minus 90 degrees. So, oh, sorry, making a mistake here. I'm too busy thinking about the previous question. Glad I spotted that. So that would have been embarrassing. Okay, of course, there's not just the inductor in this circuit, right? There's this 200 ohm resistor. Okay, so what I'm going to do, forget I did that conversion to phasor form. I've recognized that these two components, they've both got values in ohms. And they're in series, so I can add them together. Okay, just like I would do two resistors, I can add these two together. So I can say Z total equals 200 plus J 200. That's the combined impedance of those two components. This is a real number, but this is an imaginary number. And when we add them together, we get 200 plus J 200. So to solve for the current now, what we really need to do is do 50 with no angle divided by 200 plus J 200. But of course I can't do that immediately because I've got a phasor divided by a complex number. I've got several options to solve this. I could convert that phasor into a complex number and do a complex division, or I could com convert the denominator into a phaser and do um, a phaser division. And that's the way I'm gonna solve this one. So, you know, if I wasn't presenting this on the slide, I wouldn't do this, but let's just talk about how we can convert this into a phaser. We could draw an argon, an argon diagram. We've got real and imaginary, and we know we're coming along the real axis 200. And we know we're going up the imaginary axis 200. Now, if we were, if this was a minus 200, we'd be coming down. That defines a point in space, and basically the phaser we're after is defined by that um, length and that angle. Okay, so we can do that. We can find that length by doing 200 squared plus 200 squared all square rooted. And we can find the angle by doing tan minus one, the complex part, so 200 over 200. I'm going to remove that and write it out. So in phasor form, this becomes 200 squared plus 200 squared, all square rooted. And the angle is tan minus one, 200 over 200. I can already tell you that's 45 degrees, but let's get the calculator. Make sure we're working in degrees. Um, so we've got 200 squared, add 200 squared, all square rooted, gives me an answer of 282. And the angle, basically inverse tan of one, gives you 45 degrees. So now we can write this impedance as a phasor, which equals 50 divided by 282 
point eight at forty five degrees. I'm going to tap that into the, the calculator. Fifty divided by two eight two point eight gives me a current of zero point one seven six. Make sure you can see that. And now the phase angle is going to be zero minus forty five. So it's going to be minus 45 degrees. So that's the current waveform in phase of form. And our last step is to write that as a current in the time domain. So we can do that I of T equals 0 0.176 cos 2000 T minus 45 degrees. Okay. So there we've used our impedance to calculate the current and really the last step, the last thing we could do if we wanted to, I'll probably just show you in SPICE rather than actually do it, is to calculate the voltage across this inductor. So we take our probably easiest to use the phasor form of the current, multiply it by the phasor form of this impedance to calculate the voltage. So let's have a look now on LT SPICE at this circuit. So we take our LT spice, we need to modify what we've already done. And now we'll run our simulation. I think everything else is the same. And we can see there that our current peak is around 176. It's a little bit lower, probably because I'm not working very accurately. We're using my calculator. And we can see that the phase angle is no longer 90 degrees between current and voltage. There's actually a, a shift, and that shift is now 45 degrees. Uh, let me zoom out a little bit so that's a bit clearer. So you can see here, it doesn't, you know, if it was at 90 degrees, it would be peaking when the other one's around there. So it's somewhere halfway between. So it's a 45 degrees phase shift. So there we've used impedance to find the current in that circuit. And the voltage in that circuit, let's just have a look. Let's, there's the inductor, and there's the voltage across that inductor is around 35 volts. And that's going to be important now, because when I go back to the slides, I've got some questions for you to do. So we've just calculated or seen in SPICE that in this particular circuit, the voltage amplitude across this inductor is 35 volts. And now I've got a question for you guys to do. So follow the same process, but this time the frequency we're operating at is actually, you know, I've put two examples down here, but concentrate on just doing the first one. Um, we've reduced it by a factor of 10. We're no longer operating at 2000 radians per second. We're operating at 200 radians per second. So what I'd like you to do is spend probably 10 minutes or maybe a little less finding at least the voltage across this inductor at 200 radians per second. Okay, so start now, and I'm just going to go and get a glass of water. Okay, so let's go and have a look at this. Um, let's move over to whiteboard. So what I've done is I've... Just to save some time, I've gone to the point where I've calculated the current. So let's just look at the first case. I'm going to draw a line here. These are two separate scenarios. So this is when we've got the lower frequency conditions. So we've still got an amplitude of 50 volts, cosine, but now we're at 200 radians per second rather than 2000 radians per second. Okay, That means that the inductor is going to have a different impedance. It's not going to be the same as the previous question. It's going to change. And because the frequency is reduced, the impedance is also reduced, okay? And this makes sense, right? If you think about an inductor, it is just a piece of wire at DC. So if omega is equal to D zero, J omega L also is equal to zero, and that would be basically a short circuit zero ohm. So as we go lower in frequency, the lower the impedance becomes. So I've done that. Of course, the resistor doesn't change its impedance or resistance with frequency. There's no omega term there. It's just equal to R. So we follow the same process. We add the two impedances together. So we get 200 plus J20. We convert the 
impedance into its phasor form, we do a phasor division, and we see the current in this case is equal to basically this phasor here. And let's skip to the, the higher frequency case before we calculate the voltages. So in this case, the voltage was 50 cos, and then I think it was 20,000, yes, 20,000 radians per second. Okay, so of course now, because we're doing J omega L, omega's big, then our impedance is going to be big. So we've got J 2000 ohms. I've gone for exactly the same process here. Um, I've added the two series impedances together. I've done voltage divided by impedance in the phasor form. And I was just about to calculate the answer of, so 50 divided by 2009.97, I think that is, is 0 0.025 at an angle of minus 84.3. Degrees. Struggling to read my writing there, so when I upload the video, if I've made a mistake and that isn't a point free, I'll fix it. It's, it's roughly that value. Okay, so now we have the two currents blowing around these loops. Let's think about the voltages across this inductor. So first, let's think about the low frequency case. We have our inductor here, and we know it's got an impedance of J20, so I'm going to write that as... 20 with a 90 degree phase shift. All I've done there is a conversion from complex form to phase form. Then I'm going to multiply that by the current I calculated flowing around that loop, and that will give me the voltage. So multiplied by 0.248 at an angle of minus 5.71. That equals V. And when I tap that into my calculator, I basically times the length. So I do 20 times 0 0.248, which gives me 4.96. And it gives me an angle of zero. And then I add angles when I'm multiplying. So zero add minus 5.7 still gives me minus 5.7 degrees. So you can see now, We've put a voltage of 50 volts in, and our amplitude of voltage across our inductor is only 5 volts. In the previous example, when we looked at SPICE, where the frequency was 10 times higher, the voltage was 35 volts. Okay, This is going to be important, so I'm going to call that voltage at the lower frequency. I'll, I'll say that's the lower frequency, and this is the higher frequency case. So let's do the same analysis. Let's do voltage at the higher frequency. And that equals our impedance, which is now 2,000. So 2,000 at an angle of 90 degrees. So again, don't forget, I've done a phasor conversion. So from complex to phasor. Now I need to multiply by my current 0 0.025. Park this for a moment. Let's go back to this expression here. Of course, this isn't 0. It's 90 degrees. So when we do 90 plus minus 5.7, of course, we don't get a phase shift of 5. We get um, 90 minus 5.7. So what's that? 84.3. Sorry, well spotted in the chat there. Cheers. So let's go back to this one now. And we'll write our current 84.3. And that gives us, so I'm going to do 2,000 times this. 2,000 times... 0 0.025, which gives us 50, okay, at an angle of 90 plus minus 84, so basically 6 degrees. I'm creating some corners there, that should be 5.7, but you get the idea. So this brings me on to an important point. So here you can see we've gone from a low frequency where we had very low voltage across that inductor to at high frequencies where we've got a quite a high voltage. In fact, we've got all nearly all our volts dropped across that inductor. And that is the basis of a filter circuit. Okay, let me go back to the slides. Okay, so you remember you've seen a, a recording studio and these recording desks or equalizer desks or whatever they're called. It's basically just full of these kind of components, you know, resistors, capacitors. And we'll look at SPICE very quickly in the last five minutes of the lecture just to, just to highlight exactly what's going on there. 
So here's our circuit. And if you remember, this was sort of our medium frequency case, so at 318 hertz. So if I go into SPICE and I change that frequency now, let's make the frequency 10 times lower. So we'll make it 31.8 hertz. And we'll run that simulation. And we'll look at the voltage just across the inductor. As we calculated, we've got 5 volts across it. Let's increase the frequency by a factor of 10. Now across that inductor, we've got, you know, 35 volts peak. Now let's go another factor of 10 up in frequency. And we've got 50 volts peak across that component. So imagine if this was music, you know, music's a mixture of low frequencies and high frequencies. In this particular case, if you replace your sign source with like a music player, like an iPad or some iPod maybe or something, then here the low frequencies would be attenuated and the high frequencies would pass through very easily. And actually what we can do in LT Spice, instead of individually simulating each frequency, we can do what's called an AC sweep. So if I say an AC amplitude of 50 volts and I change my analysis type to, um, to do a, an AC sweep, so what I'm going to do is I'll do a decade sweep number of points 1000 and I'm going to start my frequency let's start at 1 hertz and let's go right up to I don't know 1 megahertz okay when I run this let me just change this scale when we're talking about um, filters we're going to be talking about decibels but we haven't covered that yet so let's just change it here and actually you can see the characteristic of this filter so ignore the dashed line or this this painter line here and what we can see is if your input signal is at 10 hertz, then your output voltage across that inductor is going to be like 2 volts. Whereas if your frequency is at 100 hertz, you know, your output voltage would be 14. And then as we go to very high frequencies, so the treble in your music, it's unattenuated. We're putting 50 volts in and we're getting 50 volts out. So this circuit here is the basis of our, our lectures on filters which we'll be doing in a few weeks' time. So basically, if you understand this circuit now, you've got a great head start for that, that session. You know, you, you'll be able to understand those filters, no problem, because we're going to change this for a capacitor. We'll swap its position with a resistor, and, you know, we, we'll learn about different types of filters. So just to summarize, we use reactants to calculate the peak current in a circuit and then discussed its limitations. We then used the impedance to solve some circuits and explored what happens when we vary the frequency. For a far more detailed analysis, be sure to check out my videos AC3 and AC4. So if you like this video, please like and subscribe. And of course, if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat. Thanks for watching.